I'd like to start I like I like to start this morning with a question. How does fear impact your sense of identity? So I want you just to think for a second about that. How does fear impact your sense of identity? And as you're thinking about that, I just want to remind us that Paul writes his letter to the Romans in part to address the, le- the legalistic believer who is always struggling to be good enough and to do enough to please God. And so they might have a certain answer to this question about what they're afraid of, uh, maybe a, f- a fear of inadequacy to do enough to please God. And then Paul is also writing the letter of the, of the Romans to the complacent person who feels like um, they don't really have to do anything to please God, that um, it's not important to try to follow his word because they just cast um, themselves upon the sense of just his grace, that it doesn't really matter how they live, but they just keep casting themselves on his grace. And Paul is also discourage, uh, warning them um, that there's a real danger if we're not attentive to God's voice and to follow his, his path that he's calling us in. There's a, a danger. And um, if they're honest, those people who are complacent also have fears that they might name. Um, and so what are your fears? Uh, uh, think about it for yourself. And, when I, and I ask this question about identity because I think that's an important question. Who do we see ourselves to be? And Paul wants to encourage us this morning and affirm us and build up our sense of identity uh, in Christ, in the Holy Spirit. And if we can grab onto that this morning, it's going to speak to this question of fear. So I've given you a chance to think a little bit as I've talked here. So I'd love to hear some of your answers. Would any of you be willing to share how does fear impact your sense of identity? Anybody willing to share? Dwayne. Ah, how how other people think you are. And that affects you. That 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 fear of how will other people view me. And Oh, and that impacts your identity in the sense that sometimes it makes you respond and kind of go to, yeah, it's hard, it's hard. Yeah, that's good. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Anyone else? Sarah. Very good. So a fear of disappointing someone else can get in the way of us acting uh, in the way that we truly are. Um, very good. Yes, Janine agrees with that statement in particular. Yeah, very good. Yep. Anyone else? From this side, maybe? Anyone on this side? Brenda. Very good. Thank you. So Brenda's saying sometimes that fear can make us cautious and kind of inhibit what we do, but when we're at our best, we kind of tackle that fear and we, with God's help, address it and try to move forward. Julie.
más. That's very good. So on the one hand, Julie's uh, sharing that um, fear can, can make us feel reactionary, and she used the image of a cage. Sometimes you kind of feel trapped in, in a cage and you don't have a lot of space to react. And then on the other hand, fear can be like a core emotion that colors our feelings in other areas of life, and we don't always realize it, that it's driving our response uh, to, to how we're acting in other areas outside of what we think would be fear. I can relate to that a lot. In, in fact, um, this past year, Katie and I went through a book um, called How to Argue So Your Spouse Will Listen. And it was a really interesting reflection on how we communicate. And I realized when I went through that book, the very thing that Julie's saying is that a lot of times when I'm not communicating well with another person, it's because I have a, a sense of fear of inadequacy. Like, um, and it stems back to when I was younger as a child, not doing well in school and not feeling good enough. And so that when I don't feel good enough in the conversation, I'm, I'm not as good a, of a conversation partner or, or a friend or a support person. And so that was a very insightful comment. And I think fear can short-circuit all kinds of things in our lives. It can short-circuit our connection to God, our connection to other people, our willingness to respond to um, God's leading to do something, the Holy Spirit's prompting to do something. And so let's listen to what Paul has to say this morning about that. I wanted to highlight for us um, two aspects of our passage today. Um, in green, you'll see different font this morning in green, and that's kind of highlighting maybe parts of our lives that um, just our humanity, you know, the, maybe highlighting parts of the things that we struggle with, and the text in gold is parts of our life that are infused with God's spirit, and it's kind of the hope that we have. Uh, it'll make more sense as we go a little further, but I just want to highlight some things here first for you. Um, Paul starts out writing in verse 15, talking about a living in fear, and um, he wants us to understand that's not where we need to stay. We don't need to live life in this way. And how's he, what's, what's the first image he turns to to combat our sense of fear and how it impacts our identity? He talks about adoption. Adoption. Interesting. I don't know how many of you caught that, but this is Paul's answer to the fear that we often carry with us in life. Okay? He says, we are adopted, and when we are adopted by God, through his spirit, we're adopted, we have an intimacy that is very deep with God. We don't just refer to him formally in prayer and as though there's this great distance between us, and we always just observe formalities. We can actually cry out to God saying, Abba, Father, which I don't know how many of you know this term, Abba, it was the Aramaic term for father. It's what little kids call their daddies, a very intimate term closeness to God. We are God's children, and not only children, but then also co-heirs with Christ. So this adoption means that we are brought into all of the good things that Christ has. As a co-heir, all of the blessings and the good things, we share in it now. We, that is our inheritance. And so we may have suffering in this life, but as God's adopted children, we can anticipate ultimately in the fullest extent of, of our journey, we can anticipate glory. So I want to use this image here just to think a little bit about what's going on here in our passage. So if you think here on the, on the left side of our human family, you know, our parents, you could even plug in Adam and Eve if you want, depending on how you want to use the symbolism, but our human family um, is, is where we start life. Um, that's our origin. And over here on the right, think of the divine family, Father, Son, and Spirit. And we're adopted into this family, and the work of the Spirit is bringing about that adoption in us. So we kind of need to wrap our minds to, today around the sense of what does that adoption mean? Um, how does it happen? So part of it is the Spirit enters our life, and we have this connection with God. We can call him Abba. So there's that emotional awareness of, of relationship with God. But then also part of this adoption process is a transformation of who we are, a, a spiritual journey that we're on, where we grow. Um, sometimes this is called sanctification. 
Um, we often call it, as Anabaptists, we call it discipleship, but it's this idea of a, of a process, a journey, where we're being changed as we're a part of this family, as we're adopted into this family. And it's a beautiful image of God doing something very meaningful in us, and it's something core to who we are. It's our, core to our identity. Core to our identity. So just think, let that sink in for a second. We have a human family. We have a divine family. And it's part of our journey, and it's a good thing. God has brought us in and is shaping us and changing us. Let's look a little further. Paul has some really interesting images this morning. And, and I'm, I want to show you another one here in a minute to kind of go further past this idea of adoption. So Paul talks about, um, in verse 21, bondage to decay. So we all can recognize bondage to decay in our world. You know, think of decay in the natural world. Trees die, fall down. They decay, they become part of the soil again, which provides nutrients for new trees to grow or other plants. Um, we age as human beings. That's part of this cycle of, of decay or, or death in, in the natural world, in the natural order. But Paul says, even though that's the way our world works, there is a certain freedom and a glory that God is bringing about. It's in our lives now, but it's going to be fully consummated in the future in the establishment of his kingdom. So we have this sense of hope that this cycle of bondage and decay will one day end. But in the meantime, when we're living here and we haven't experienced that fulfillment of it yet, it's almost as though we have the pains of childbirth, which is a vivid image. Think about that for a second. Paul is now, he's talking about adoption and now he's talking about childbirth as a main image to understand this journey that we're on. The redemption of our bodies. Somehow this transformation that we're going through is akin to a childbirth. And what is involved with childbirth? Well, leading up to the birth, there's a lot of what? Pain. It's hard. It's, uh, now I can't speak from personal experience, but I've observed close hand <laughs> the, the amount of difficulty and, and, and pain and suffering it entails, right? And... Uh, Paul says that is similar to this journey we're on. But then once that comes to fulfillment and the child is born, what joy and celebration there is. And brothers and sisters, that's what the Christian life is like. One of the laws of the kingdom is that glory comes through suffering. That's the meaning of the cross. That's the way God works in our lives. And so this morning... When we think about fear, we have to hear this message that we are not to be afraid to suffer in this life. Don't be afraid to suffer because it's part of the journey that God has you on. He's going to bring you through it to glory. You're his adopted son. You're his adopted daughter. He's not going to forsake you. You are a co-heir with Christ. And no matter how hard it gets or how difficult, you're in the pains of childbirth. But that child is going to come. That birth is going to come. And you will share in that glory. So this morning, as, as we close, I just want you to go away with a few things that we can do in response to this message of hope. I think one of the first things we need to do is, is do some listening, some real listening prayer for the Spirit, because it's the Spirit who brings about this awareness that we are God's children in our hearts, this sense of we can call Him Abba, that we have this intimacy. It's also the Spirit crying with us when we do suffer. It's the Spirit, you know, Paul also says he groans with us, with, with deep groans when we're praying and we don't have words when we're going through difficulty. He intercedes with us. So we need to listen for the Spirit in our week today coming up. Will you listen and anticipate maybe some promptings? The Spirit may lead you to talk to someone or to do an act of kindness. Or the Spirit may stir up in you something in your prayer that you need to confess before God or seek healing for. Listen to the Spirit. And also, not just listen for things to do, but listen to the Spirit to receive comfort because the Spirit wants to affirm you, who you are. It wants to dispel that sense of fear that you're not good enough, that you're not doing enough to please God. The Spirit wants you to know you are loved. You're God's chosen creation. You're part of His family the Spirit also wants to challenge us. The Spirit wants us to walk in new ways and to continue that journey of growth in the image of Christ. 
so that the Spirit will bring out areas of our lives that are broken, that may have areas of sin and challenge us to repent and turn again and receive God's grace and forgiveness. But also this week, let's lament. You know, it's it's so fascinating. We, We were talking this morning in Sunday school class about grief, and it's very easy to want to avoid grief and loss and suffering in our culture. There's so many distractions. There's so many things we can do to turn to where we don't actually have to pay attention to loss or sit with a tragedy. But maybe we need a little time as Christians to lament some of the, the difficult things in our, in our world. So I encourage you, maybe take some time this week, a little time set aside in your prayer with God to lament something. Uh, it could be something in your, your own life that you, you wish would have been differently in the past or you would have responded differently or a loss you've experienced or it could be something in our broader world. But spend some time in lament and then spend some time in intercession. Praying for the situation in our world or praying before God and asking for his own work in your life or for somebody that you also are lamenting for. So I encourage you to think about doing that. And, and, and if you can't do all four of these, I understand, but just at least try to pick one to work on this week. Celebrate. Now, Part of the message of the cross is suffering, but then part of the message of the cross results in the resurrection, which is also glory. And so that's part of our message today. So we need to also remember suffering is a part of life, but God brings through suffering. Remember childbirth, he brings glory and joy at the end. And so let's celebrate something that God has done in our lives. Think about your story. What has God done? Is there something that you want to celebrate? You could write it down um, and just enjoy that memory. You could share it with somebody else this week, but try to think of something he's, he's done in your life and celebrate that. And finally, creation care. Do you realize that if you look at our passage today, that creation is tied up in with our journey of salvation? Did you read what Paul was saying, that creation is, is groaning and suffering as it experiences the cycle of decay, just as we human beings are? and that somehow the redemption of our bodies is tied up in with the redemption of God's creation that he will fulfill in the fullness of his plan. So let's acknowledge that, that creation is connected with our journey. And it's a big part of our tradition as Anabaptists to be uh, good stewards of what we have. And let's rekindle that excitement to be good stewards of God's creation in our midst, around us. Let's think about ways that we could better care for it as a church, as individuals, Maybe that can inspire our imagination for the future, where we go, some of our work and ministry in our community. Well, thank you very much for listening to our scripture this morning, for considering these ideas, and I just want to pray for us as we close. Will you please bow your heads with me? Lord God, we thank you that by your spirit, we now share a close connection with you We are part of your family. We have been adopted. And now we are the heirs and the co-heirs of all the blessings that you have given to your son, Jesus. Now we too can look forward to resurrection life and freedom and joy. Even as we experience foretaste of it now, we look forward to that fulfillment of it in your time. Lord, we also thank you that The way that you work in our world doesn't let suffering be the final word, but you bring us through times of suffering to times of healing and joy, freedom and glory. And so I pray whatever suffering that we may be experiencing right now, that you would help us to work through it and that we could acknowledge the journey that we're on with you, that we could see and we could have hope in the process that you're bringing us through and trust that you are going to bring growth and trust that you're going to bring healing and trust that you're going to bring uh, peace to us through this. And finally, Lord, this week, may we be open to your Spirit's leadings. Help us to reach out to others and love others and to share your joy with them. And also inspire our thinking so that we can be good stewards of your creation and of all the blessings and good things you've given us. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's people said.